You are listening to Faithless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Rogue. Each week we design new decks for tournament play. We put our creations to the test and share our findings on the air. Today we crack open the Brewer's Mailbag and answer your questions about Modern and Pioneer. Which four decks would you play for the rest of your life? What if Innistrad were added to Pioneer? Who is the greatest deck builder of all time? These questions and much more will be answered today. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show! Welcome to the Faithless Brewing Podcast. I am David Robertson, and I am joined by Mr. Mordekaiser himself, joining us from Buenos Aires. What is going on, Mord? Hey, all. Thanks so much, David. I'm really glad to be here. Everything is going great. Just spending this beautiful night here with my girlfriend, waiting for us to have some delicious carbonara, and, well, getting ready to answer some fun questions. How are you? I am great as well. It's nice to uh, see you again. We haven't uh, hosted a podcast in a while. Now we get to do two in a row. That's always nice. And we are, of course, joined by the CEO, El Capitan. El Capitano. Exactly. <laughs> he is Cave Den Online, Dr. Daniel Schriever. What is going on, my friend? I'm doing good. More, I didn't know you were cooking me carbonara tonight. And yeah, I'm <laughs> glad that our relationship is <laughs> finally putting some labels on it. I love that we were able to put a label on it. Yeah, everybody. Somehow, we don't know how me, the one with the long hair, has is actually the male in the relationship, and we have got Dan <laughs> to admit he's the girlfriend. It was a tough choice, but here we are, and I'm cooking something delicious for him. Yes. I'm currently Dr. Shriver, but maybe someday Mrs. Mord. <laughs> <laughs> Why get Do- the DR degree Dr. when you can Mord. get the MRS degree, as uh, we used yeah, to say Yeah, I love about. that he has to lose his doctor title. <laughs> It's never a Dr. Mord. Dr. Smord. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we have a very fun show planned. Hopefully everybody tuned in on Friday. We talked about the latest spoilers. There was a handful of them. We went through the other uh, news, some Twitter drama, of course. For today, we are going to talk about what the listeners would like to talk about. We opened up the mailbag to the members of our Discord, and they delivered with a bunch of, I think, really interesting questions. Just a quick reminder, though, before we get to all that fun, we need to do a little housekeeping. Uh, if you enjoy the show and you'd like to support us, the best way to do so is to go to patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing. Join at whatever level you feel is appropriate. One of the things you get to do is offer uh, mailbag questions if there's questions you'd like us to answer. You also get access to the Discord. There's tons of crazy ideas and discussions happening there. You get to vote on the new monthly project. With the Serum Visions podcast, the action is heating up. Daniel, the uh, the fate of the cards that we will be brewing around are, is in the balance. Oh, yes. Actually, I think the voting will have just closed by the time this episode comes out, so we, were, we will soon be able to reveal the winner. Ooh, that's exciting. And then we get to, you know, roll up our sleeves and start to brew. Can't wait. All right, so with that out of the way... Let us get to the mailbag. Our first question is from I Am The Law 2004. Shout outs to Judge Dredd. If you could tweak one quote unquote close but not quite card to make it modern playable, which card would you tweak and how would you adjust it? More to you first. Hmm. So I see the response one of you guys has, and I just want to <laughs> say I'm personally attacked. But just regarding that, I think there's quite a few of them. So modern playable and close enough, I think it would have to be like it's more than a card, it's like a it's like the taxes package. Like I would make Leonin Arbitra 2-3, Archon of Emeria 2-4, and just hope I could play taxes in modern. <laughs> like tiny nibbles to all the cards, like the whole deck, because every single card is unplayable nowadays. Oh, that's interesting. So you're saying that changing the toughness of those taxes creatures... Yeah, I think Leonin Arbiter being able to block Ragavan is huge. 
I think that a whole lot of stuff just piles up immediately. Like, from game to game, you don't know this, but I think I have never had such a realization of how a tiny thing changes your games. Like, when the fact Abundant Growth was back, I don't know if you remember, like, a year ago, mm. my win rate went up 9% just when that got changed. Just because the fact that Abundant Growth now works on non-basics when opponent has a Blood Moon. So specific, and then you just realize all the scenarios where that changed, and it's a huge amount. So yeah, I think just pumping up that, that single dish is like Leonid now blocks Ragavan, Archon of Emeria now doesn't die to Bolt. Even something as tiny as Flicker Whisp is now a 3 2 flyer makes the deck pretty good. So, what is that Spider Silk Armor gives all your creatures plus 0 plus 1? You just want a permanent Spider Silk Armor for the, the mono white? Yeah. <laughs> The crappy amount of white creatures. <laughs> you can even remove the part that gives them reach. I don't need that. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> that would be crazy. That would be crazy. That would be insane. <laughs> no, I think there's an enchantment with morph that's exactly that. Parapet emblem or something. Yep. Thank you, boomers. All right, Dan, what do you say? All right, so my tweak to make a card modern playable is Lurus of the Dream Den. My tweak would be I would remove the companion mechanic from it and just make it a normal card. I would also take away the hybrid mana. I would make it just be one white black because, I mean, I understand what they were going for. Like, okay, there's going to be 10 companions. We should make them hybrid so that as many decks can use them as possible. But I'm done with companion. Enough of that. So, like, let's just make this a real card, which should be white and black. And I think it would actually be a cool card. Second card, <laughs> this is my personal attack at Emmys. I would also tweak Yorian in the same way, remove the companion clause. So Coward. here I'm imagining future modern in which Yorian has been banned in about three months. <laughs> Maybe I'll throw you a bone. I'll say that Yorian should be tweaked to just two white blue, no companion. Make that a modern legal card, and yeah, I think that'll be interesting. What about you, David? Um, I would probably find some way to make Looter Scooter playable in modern since it's banned in Pioneer. <laughs> I don't know what that would be. Uh, is it just adding a, a toughness? Uh, is it adding a power? It feels like only a minor tweak would be needed, um, but I don't know what that would be. Crew Zero. <laughs> I think... No, I don't think it's Loot like twice? <laughs> no, no. Loot twice. <laughs> Loot twice would be great. But not on blocks, right? So you take away some... <laughs> don't loot draw no that's crazy you can't do that on an attack i mean i think just look at sea balloon what about crew pay to life oh that's interesting two minus three three i don't think that's playable it'd be awesome in uh uh death shadow wouldn't it yeah but i don't think the card is good like two minus three three flyer pay to life to attack hmm. i would have played that I think you have to go, like, in, we have reached a point in modern where every single card has to go, okay, this is good, and then you add an extra paragraph. <laughs> oh, look, this Rogan creature is good. Okay, give it Blitz. Yeah, I, I, don't, <laughs> I, I don't know what the exact card would be, but it, it would be Looter Scooter as printed with some, you know, whatever necessary upgrades necessary so that I could play it. No, you're, you know what we good? Like, not meme, like, draw a card that might be insane, but, like, World 2. Hmm. Yeah. It's like, make it hard to remove. Yeah. All right. Next question. First turn negator writes, Wizards of the Coast is proposing a change to modern that will ban the Zendikar Khan's fetch lands, but Prismatic Vista will gain the text. A deck may contain any number of cards named Prismatic Vista. They've also promised to reprint it into the ground. WotC has hired you as part of a team to of expert consultants to assess this change. You're the tiebreaker. Do you accept or reject the change? Why? Daniel. This feels like a real interview question, right? <laughs> like, I feel like I'm being hired. <laughs> I feel like the way the question is worded implies that a lot of decks would want to play Prismatic Vista. And I believe, after doing my focus group studies, that that would just not happen. Like, very few decks would actually build this theoretical Prismatic Vista mana base. And what you would end up with is instead most decks just playing like pioneer mana. You know, you, you still have shocks, you just don't have fetches anymore, and you just play whatever other fast lands and pathways and stuff. And that would be like a net negative for modern. For that reason, I would say no to that. Also, just from the business perspective, they would they would never reprint prismatic vista to the ground. That's a foolish financial decision. On the other hand, like you could think of the question as like, okay, well, what if the question is, what happens if you add Prismatic Vista to Pioneer? That actually gets kind of interesting. 
Uh, yeah, you probably just have to immediately ban the all the delve spells. So yeah, you totally change the format. I mean, it doesn't do anything else. <laughs> I don't think those can coexist, and I don't think that we will ever see the ban of Fetchlands in Modern for the same reason we will never see the ban of Brainstorm in Legacy. The f- basis of the format, if Fetchlands, and whenever I have an argument with someone, they go like, "This card is bastard." I go like, "Is it more bastard than Fetchlands?" And as long as the answer is no, you have no argument to ask for a ban. Faceless are bastard. But Prismatic Vista is in a class by itself, right? It forces you to play like a really weird, basic land heavy mana base. There are not very many decks that can actually do that. Prismatic Vista tends to be complementary of the Fetchlands. In a normal Fetchland deck, you can run one or two Vistas if you're playing three or four color, especially if you're playing Quarrel. So it tends to be a complementary of the Fetchlands rather than a replacement due to how it works. And no one plays with it anymore. Like, no. It's just better to play Triumphs. It died with Astrolabe. So let's imagine you want to play Ragavan on turn one and Dalty Voidwalker on turn two. Like You just like cannot do that in a Prismatic Vista mana base. It's just not possible. Yeah, or counter spell, or yeah. Whatever. I mean, you have to get you know you have to get crazy lucky with some filter land or something. But yeah, to your point, Dan, functionally it's impossible. Yeah, yeah, it's not advisable. So I think people would realize that quickly and would just abandon Prismatic Vista. They'd be like, all right, if I want to play multicolor, I'll just look at Pioneer mana bases. Yeah. Now, that's still going to be a playable format. It would be different format, for sure. But I don't know. What, what do you think, David? Do you veto this change, or do you endorse it? Well, you have to veto it for the money purposes. Immediately, this person would be terminated from their <laughs> yes. position with extreme prejudice. <laughs> exactly. And yeah, the Fetch Shock mana base is the only thing in Modern that actually extends back to the format's creation. Everything else has literally just been murdered in the crib. So the illusion that this is still part of like the modern era of cards and you have all these sets you can pick from uh, is held together by the mana base that goes all the way back. No other cards basically do this. I don't think there's a single creature played that hasn't been printed in the last like three or four years. Um, so yeah, you still need this to have the illusion that like Modern is a thing it was sold to us as and... So getting rid of that would be pretty crippling, I think. I agree. All right, on to our next one. Kilgore Trout 503 says, who is the most impactful brewer of all time and why? So we have to expose Mord here. He did not know who Michael J. Flores was. You don't need to expose me. I will proudly say you are boomers, and I have no idea who you're talking about. Did no I? respect. No, no respect for the, the, the pioneers of this game. No, I tap don't. Out con- tap out control. <laughs> but, <so> Kaiga. <laughs> every single thing you're mentioning right now is very, very, very before I was born. Which automatically disqualifies it. Vampiric Tutor for Phyrexian Processor. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I was born in 99. You're describing, you're describing text from 98. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good time for magic. I wasn't even conceptually born. Do we need to uh, have the pre-Mord format? <laughs> <laughs> only, cards printed, only cards printed before Mord's mother was inseminated by his father. <laughs> Pre-Mordern. Pre-Mord okay. format is pre pre mordern exactly. <laughs> Pre-Mordern? Urian is the only modern card legal in this format. Oh. <laughs> Everything else has to be before he was born. You know the worst part? Urian wouldn't be playable in that format. Maybe as a main deck card. So as a uh, Zoomer who doesn't know anything about Magic's history, who do you think the most impactful brewer was? Is <laughs> I don't have a true answer to this. I think that, so, not only I am young, I started playing Magic not long ago, and when I started playing Magic, I don't remember everybody told me about, yeah, this is what Raid Yuke is playing, yeah, this is what XX Amazing Player is playing. And that was four years ago when I started playing, and two years from now with the pandemic and such, the voice of reason in the four in Magic has changed from the pro players to like the people, right? Mm. In a weird okay. kind of way. Like I have this conversation a lot in my M- FNM groups and such, which are mas- mostly Magic boomers who would know who Michael Flores is, of course. When they're like, "How are you willing to say what Radio is saying is wrong?" and I'm like, "I don't care. Whatever Radio says about Fork or Omnath, or I don't care what Nasif says about Esper." Animator. If I'm going to talk about Desperate Animator, I'm going to talk to Spike. And if I want to talk about Titan, I'm talking to one of the three Titan animals I know on Twitter, who are, I'm pretty sure, we have a lot more insight into this than Nasif. Not because he's not an amazing player, but because how magic is built nowadays has changed a lot. 
I don't think I can pinpoint a specific brewer because everything has become so like community normal right now. I don't know. If not, Saffron Olive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my answer is Saffron Olive for the present era. If I had to name someone, it's, it's the first person I saw actually brew. I, I mean, I think that's exactly it, right? Like, Michael J. Flores is my boomer answer just because of, you know, his, his role at that stage of Magic's evolution and growth as a game. But in terms of, like, what is the current status of brewing in Magic as it exists now, I think without Saffron Olive, there's much less of an appetite for brewing. It's less acceptable to be like, oh, I like playing Jank, or oh, it's cool to just try to, like, assemble cool combos. And he did it in a sneaky way, right? Like, if you look at his earliest stuff, back when MPG Goldfist was just, like, a twinkle in Richard's eye, a finance site, and he got Saffron Olive to write articles about buying and selling collections. And the very first article Saffron Olive did about, like, a, a jank deck was just like, oh, I just think it's fun. I just, I just love brewing myself. I just want to do it. And Richard said, okay, whatever. And the audience came, like, just by sheer force of will and by his personality. And now he's, like, outside of Tellurian Community College, he's like maybe the most important magic personality and he's a brewer and that's, it's huge. Yeah. Now it doesn't translate that much to like the competitive side of brewing, uh, but I feel like there, there wouldn't be as much of an audience for someone like Aspiring Spike without Saffron Olive. And to kind of piggyback on Mord's point to support you, Dan, the competitive part of magic has been destroyed uh, through certain actions of Wizards of the Coast. Obviously uh, COVID affected them, etc. So all these things going back to like the Hall of Fame and Pro Tours, I mean, they, th those things just don't exist anymore. So things that were important to that, which, you know, Michael Flores maybe had more of an effect on, um, you know, just don't, just don't mean as much. So is Michael Flores your answer, David? No, I actually think Patrick Chapin is, was the better brewer at the time. Mm. Obviously, he's come up with a bunch of crazy decks himself. Um, he also has been on a bunch of teams that have broken the format. But in terms of like the casual, but it was almost casual competitive, I think Conley Woods was, is actually the most impactful brewer. Um, you know, he actually designed a bunch of decks that won GPs, uh, top aided pro tours, like that he was literally the only person in the entire room playing. I think it's very rare. It's, it's almost unheard of in the dying embers of the pro tour for one person in the entire format to be on a deck and for that person to top eight. I mean, it basically doesn't happen. Haven't heard that name in a while. Yeah, uh, struggling with some legal uh, difficulties that we uh, won't uh, get too deep into. But yeah, I mean, Pat Chapin is a Hall of Famer and basically is in, in the Hall of Fame because of his brewing. Uh, Z Mauschewitz is another person who's basically in the Hall of Fame because he's come up with a bunch of crazy decks. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's hard to say because Magic, what Magic has become to Moore's point is much more community focused, much more populist. And their the architecture of you know what quote unquote matters is totally totally changed in the last three years. So yeah, it may be that it's Saffron Olive or Aspiring Spike, right? The or, or you know streamers that people watch that don't play competitively at all. Yeah, the Spike is like not ironically the spikiest of the brewers, and then you will just see stuff like Dylan, who just doesn't care about winning anymore. <laughs> I mean, among like the content creators, there are not that many brewers. I think the way you started your answer, Morda, you were naming, to me, I would consider those people deck experts, but I wouldn't consider them brewers. You know, who is the current expert on insert and archetype here, Omnath? So I, eventually I think we will find ourselves on a question that, what is a brew? Yeah, fair enough. And I think we're going to get a lot more into this topic in a few minutes. So I think I shouldn't get into it right now. All right, so let's move on to the next question. Jack Hart writes, you can build any four decks to play against each other for the rest of time as your own personal metagame for friends and family game night. You will never again play Magic with or against any other decks. Which four decks do you pick? Daniel, we will put it to you first. Well, it's an interesting question because I've actually done this a few times. Not for like the Desert Island bunker scenario that Jack Hart is describing, but I think very realistically, like... Okay, you want to have like a magic battle box, we'll call it, on your shelf alongside your other games. And for a few of my friends over the years who like don't play that much magic, I just like have made a little battle box for them as a gift so that if they want to enjoy magic and experience it sometimes, they'll have six ish decks that are like well balanced against each other, that have some replayability, that show off the different styles of magic decks. And I actually do recommend it if you just like are bored and want to do an exercise sometime. Um, hmm. Yeah, come up with a battle box of decks that 
you know, it doesn't even matter what power level they're at. It doesn't have to be in a, a current format. It could just be casual. It could just be draft leftovers. But it's a fun exercise. Can we clarify? And this is maybe just me not understanding. I thought Battle Box was a draft format. Is that not true? Uh, originally it was, but eventually that just became called Cube instead, and people forgot that there was ever a draft format called Battle Box. Oh, okay. I never heard about it as a draft format. I always heard about it as you arrive at a friend's home, there's six play ball, you just drop a bunch of decks that don't play well against each other. Okay. Yeah, it was a draft format like more than 10 years ago. It was kind of niche. And then the term was not used for a while. And then maybe five years ago, people started using it as what Emmy just described. Um, but yeah, it's actually a great idea to just, you know, it's a great way to use your left over magic cards. So I don't know if I could pick four to answer Jack's questions, but replayability so actually like a mix of singletons and like two and three ofs representing the full range of magic styles i don't know i really liked blue red for example because the combination of damage based removal counter magic and its creatures just tends to lead to interesting gameplay so that'd definitely be one of the decks uh, nothing too linear nothing too like no spell based combo or graveyard decks because those tend to be a little boring over time all right mord I think I would strive. I am actually facing this question a few days from now because I'm trying to, I'm trying to get the right combination of decks to teach MTC to my partner, which means I have to find some a way that whenever she sits down, she's gonna enjoy it in the slightest. Which means the perfect combination of not too weak, so it doesn't make sense, and not too powerful, so it doesn't make sense on the other side. And that has just been the thing that if I had to choose four decks, I think I would hand build four decks that would include main archetypes of magic that play the well against each other. So you would have a traditional rare or mainly rare aggro deck, a controlling a Sodius or such deck, a mid range in the in the regard of what's like mid range, and then something that actually involved the graveyard but not in a busted sort of way. More like playing cards with Delirium and interesting strategies that involve that aspect of the game. Like a synergy-heavy deck. A synergy-heavy graveyard deck, but not like in a comboish way. Not in like saying Dredge is a synergy-based deck. Yeah, that's a great that's a great mix. Hearing you say that, my four are Is It Tempo, White-based Creature Aggro, Black-Green Graveyard Synergy, and then uh, like a... a green red rampish kind of deck yeah yeah that sounds pretty fun if if, if there was only four decks i could play for the rest of time i would just stop playing magic um, <laughs> like I, I don't have to do this i i actually like the idea of cube or something is something that has like borderline infinite replayability if i yeah. you know paid dan ten thousand dollars to construct like the perfect cube for me um <laughs> that i if i had to play it forever I, I think he could create one that would like entertain me for many years but if you're talking about like pre-built constructed decks, yeah, I'd just, I'd just be out uh, on that question. I think I would stop playing Magic as much as I do, of course, but I think I would still play it closer to a board game. Like I meet with yeah. friends that enjoy the game, they just sit down, have a few games, like, have a laugh, have a few drinks. and So it's pretty close to the reason I have never even touched pre-modern. I think when things get sold, they get boring. Yeah. All right, great question from Jack Hart. Next question Emmy uh, references earlier, Raptor1551 writes, how many cards different from a meta deck does a lift have to be to be considered a brew? We will let you take the first crack at it, Mr. Moore. So after reading both of your answers, I think I disagree completely. <laughs> In the fact that I think a brew doesn't have to be different due to the cards they play. It's not a number of cards, a number of playsets, or a ma or a different concept. I think you reach the brew situation when you change the game plan enough. For example, let's go really relevant and close example. Either Mesha Touch, Reanimator by Spike, I think it's a brew. If it wasn't played by Spike, everybody would say it's a brew. We're not arguing if it's a brew because it's a Spike deck and Spike wins with a ham sandwich. I think the only change he made to that deck was a uh, further mesh touch, two of the black land whose name I can't ever remember, and nothing else. Uh, yeah. And the deck plays completely different. I think the he changed later than 10 cards on an already proven deck, and the gameplay changed significantly enough to where you not, cannot answer the deck in the same way now. That seems pretty close to my answer, if I'm being honest with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but in this one specific, it's because it's a four-off. But it could be less. 
But yeah, it's closer to use to yours than Dan. Yeah, my answer initially was eight to ten, depending on how important those cards are to the strategy. But I mean that that is a good example you're giving. So if you're only introducing one new card, but it completely changes the strategy, then. But I think yeah. I have an opposite point. When everybody was playing <laughs> eighty, like you can change twenty cards and not be a brew. When everybody was playing. Nowadays, I was playing the four-color control shell. I changed 16 cards out of the traditional four-color deck, and it's the same deck. Yeah, I don't consider any of the Omneth decks a brew. Yeah, but that's what I mean, because... Well, all what the about, Omneth... like, bro... if you're playing Broadback, doesn't that lead to a bunch of different choices, though? Yeah, but the gameplay is the same. I'm playing a long-controlling game where all I have to do is remove my opponent's board, and until eventually my opponents concede due to boredom, a 1-1 one -one coal or an Omneth on board. I always try to that, I always reach at the exact same way, and my game plan is the same. I'm not making any new shenanigans. I guess if you're making a deck that is, like you say, an established archetype, uh, but it's teched out sufficiently so that the mirror match is like heavily favored to you, I consider that to be a brew. Like when Jerry Thompson was playing um, the Stoneforge Mystic deck in Standard, but he added red and just played four Bolt, I think that's literally all he did. And he just started like crushing everybody. Like that to me is a brew, but it plays it out exactly the same way. You're still casting Stoneforge okay. Mystic. You're still equipping it with the uh, sort of whatever. So let's go to like a really close example. Around two months ago, Antoine and later me started playing the four color Delirium build, which eventually became one of the mainstays. Was that a brew? Where only yes. thing with because we are the four Mistress Bubble and Traverse the Urban Wall and Unholy Heat. And it changed your matchup profile because you're able to traverse for whatever. Emrakul, was that the point? Yeah, the, the, you win all the mirrors because you have a main deck Emrakul to cast on turn 7 8. Because it's exactly. exactly what you're saying. We changed like yeah. small stuff, we changed scan yep. for traverse, and it changed the plan of the deck. Yeah, to me, that's a brew. I, I thought that Jerry Thompson, that I forget the season, Dan, maybe, whatever, after the Channel Fireball guys came up with the uh, Cobblade and then. Jerry Thompson would somehow, like, each week tweaked it enough to always be ahead of everybody else and just, like, crush that whole summer. I, don't, I just remember it vaguely, but you, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I do agree with you that it's a brew because it's the first time I have played that deck differently in that I don't have to control the game. I have to stall the game until I can end Rakul. Like, it plays differently. I'm not getting ahead. I'm stalling a lot of the time. So you guys feel like even though, like in those examples, you're starting with a known meta deck, even with like the stock version of it and saying, all right, I can change one card in it and it will change something. That That is considered brewing. I don't think one card is enough. I think the game plan in a significant amount of matchups should change. I think, for example, in the Delirium version, which is like the highest tested version I have of this sort of stuff, the fact that, for example, like in Scape Shift, all I'm doing is I'm not trying to like lock them out of the game. I'm just gaining life and surviving until I can resolve an Emrakul. I'm like the com I'm like stalling until that point. Or the other day I faced Squatchy. I don't remember who I faced, and I was like soliturning my own stuff, two for winning myself every single turn because all I needed was to get to turn seven. I mean, I would even call it a brew if you were playing the exact stock seventy or sixty, and then you had like crazy tech in your sideboard. Like if you had six or mm. seven cards that no one else was playing. And it totally altered your matchup uh, profile, your your matchup spread profile. I would consider that to be a brew. Okay, interesting. So three different perspectives from going from dance more. You need a lot of changes to one to us going more like no, as long as it plays slightly different, it's a brew. All right, on to our next question. We have Marty Quief writes, what is your favorite magic card of all time? Not necessarily the best, but pet cards or something with lots of nostalgia. Dan, your answer here is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my answer is Otherworldly Gaze. Not my favorite of all time, but I'm, I'm going to seize on the pet card aspect of this. I cast Otherworldly Gaze probably more than any other card right now. Um, mm -hmm. And it's... To be honest, like, it's just a lot of fun. Like, it's satisfying to me. I love resolving it. You get to do it twice every time you draw it, which is super cool. And just won me a lot of money. Like, I qualified for the Pro Tour with it in that Pioneer is a control deck. I did well in the modern PTQ with Crabvine. And, you know, I've been doing well with that in paper as well. I consider it like a good card, but I just look around and don't see it in any other decks, which makes me a little bit sad. So I guess it's just going to be a pet card. 
Have you cast more otherworldly gaze than any other magic player? It's possible. No, I'm not. Even, I haven't even cast more than other crabvine players. I mean, Anthony Menino casts. How many crabvine players can there possibly be? There's one, and it's Anthony, and he's like severely overdone in a number of. Okay. All right. So you're, <laughs> you're, you're top. You're top three. But yeah, I also play it in. Um, in like, is it Phoenix in both modern? I was gonna say you're you're playing it in all kinds of formats. Oh, yeah. You're not just playing in crabvine. Exactly. But that's me. What about you guys? So what about David? You have it straight up. No doubt. Yeah. My my favorite card of all time is Ninja of the Deep Hours. Second favorite card is Birds of Paradise, <laughs> especially the revised Birds of Paradise. And then third, Sylvan Library. Hmm. I actually have four. I have beta. Really? Birds of Paradise Those from France. Wa- Oiseau de Paradis. <laughs> Uh, absolutely spectacular spectacular beautiful, beautiful card every time i have it in my opening hand it's like man i hope this doesn't die because it's so goddamn beautiful <laughs> and if it resolves sort of almost like the sakura tribe elder it's just like the next turn you feel like you can cast any spell <laughs> like it doesn't matter how terrible your mana base was if you cast birds of paradise on turn one and they pass it back to you you can cast whatever you want you want to cast bant charms probably you have the mana for it <laughs> pretty likely you will <laughs> No, for me, I think I also have a top three. I couldn't just pinpoint a single card. You're Ryan. <laughs> no, actually, no. Uh, yeah, maybe. So my top three is Urion, of course, because I'm a simple man with a simple pleasure for playing big decks. Second card is Knight of the Relic Quarry. Because it does everything a card has to do. It's a toolbox package. It's a threat. It's everything I love. I just love the card. I would just play Knight of the Relic Quarry decks every single day, and I love... I, I love playing efficient lands with upside. And I think the third is a fight between... So, no, the third card is Ephemerate. The fourth card, and I, and then I just love the Voiceless Triangle Frequent Waste Interaction, and I just love that so much. If I could make that a card, I would. But I think it's um, Yorion, Ephemerate, Knight of the Relic Quarry. Super hot take. Knight of the Relic Quarry would be a super cool card to have in Pioneer. I don't disagree. Like at all. It would actually be playable there? I don't... I mean, it gets a lot worse without Fetchlands. Oh, it wouldn't be broken. That's my whole point. It no, would... exactly, exactly. And I think it would be actually a good card. Do we have... Actually, it might be broken. Do you have Retreat? Yeah. Do you have a turn 3 kill? That's really bad. Yeah. Turn 1 Elf, turn 2 Knight. <laughs> turn 3 Retreat win? Yeah, I... It's fine. That's a shock. Come on. <laughs> Grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Be a man. Who is it gonna yeah. kill? All right. So Dan's pick was haunting, but uh, your more than I picked real cards. Um. <laughs> Whoa! What? <laughs> we pick cards that have more flavor. We pick cards what? that are fun. Dan's card. He just like moving <laughs> cardboard from one zone to another, <laughs> inevitably doing something degenerate. <laughs> Always. Nobody use gaze in a fun way. Whoa! All right. He's playing four three haste for no mana. That's fun. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. Samp writes, which Faithless Brew are you most proud of? Dan, you are the founder and CEO of the Faithless Brewing Podcast. And you came up with the brew that kind of launched the podcast. So I'm guessing your answer should be Niv Mizzet, but I, I'm curious if you have A, if that if that's the answer, and B, if it's not, if there's a brew you like even more than that. Yeah, Niv Mizzet's definitely my favorite deck and one of my favorite cards. I've, I've spent so much time with it, not just like talking about it on the podcast. We spent like a year working on the deck, but also, you know, it's our logo, it's our play mats. And, it's us. You know, I went back and forth with the artists, like over like how to represent Niv in these different ways. Like I feel very close to Niv Mizzet the card. I'm not sure I'm proud of the deck because I never really built it very well, but like I'm proud of like how successful the deck has become. I don't think I can take credit for that. Dan's interaction with Nib was more of a change of per- perspective for the rest than it was him building the deck, I think. Like, without Dan, the deck wouldn't exist. Like, we built some of the early versions. Yeah, but if you hadn't made those, nobody would have. Yeah, nobody would have built this deck. It, it would not exist. Maybe somebody would have built it in Pioneer at some point, but certainly it would never have 5 out a modern list, ever. I, I believe that. Davius would have done it for sure, at least. Lawson as well, but... Anyway, what is your answers? Which Faithless Brew are you most proud of? What's your answer, Mord? I don't know. I was thinking that. I don't have that many. 
I'm <laughs> I'm not a brewer. Like I am a brewer, but I'm more of a refiner. I get ideas and then I work with them. I don't have that many brews. And my brews haven't been made here. I just collapse into them. Now you have a task ahead of you. Come up with a faithless brew that you're proud of. Yes. <laughs> By the next mailbag segment. <laughs> and if you do not, you you will be whipped. <laughs> That sounded like such insight. That was like a sensei. That was like Dan Sensei. Now you have a task in front of us. Come up with a brew that you're proud of. Snatch the pebble from my hand. (laughs) Snatch the brew from my hand. What about you, David? So yeah, my favorites are two different Sultai brews. So the Bring to Light, Narset, Days Undoing. Uh, I think there was a Notion Thief in that list. With um, like the tech card being Sylvan Carry added, added to the blue black list. So first of all, we were the first people to ever 5-0 with a Narset Days Undoing list in Pioneer. Uh, Damon played one of my brews to a 5-0. Um, and then a few other people picked it up. And every once in a while, you'd see someone 5-0 with it. And then I added a Sylvan Carry added and the Bring to Light package. And that deck was awesome. I think I 5-0, 4-1, and then you 5 would with it. We were just like on fire one week. It was so sweet. Um, I love that list. When Sylvan Carry added was unironically the best card in the format. And then before Sylvan, or excuse me, before right before Field of Dead was banned, I had an amazing Saltai list that was teched out to beat the mirror. That played Ashiok on turn two off of Gilded Goose. And then Oblivion Sower. Oh um, my god. <laughs> yeah, it was beautiful. That list never ever got 5 0 because I think I was literally 4 0 up a game and you were jumping into a uh, uh, a PTQ or something, Dan. So I had to quit. And then they banned Field of Dead like the next week. And I was just like, man, this, no one ever got to see. Like, I had outsmarted the whole format. And it, all the chat was was just people trying to play their Field of Dead uh, list that they got from Sam Black, just raging about how, like, they literally had no chance. You just play Ashiok on turn three, like, uptick, uptick. Whenever you resolve Oblivion Sower, just add, like, 40 power to the the battlefield you could not lose and it was also amazing against aggro because field of dead stabilized it was such a sweet deck and nobody had that tech and then it just got banned it never mattered like it's like how you were the first person to play the blue version of the cascade into valky dan and then like Mm. it got banned like a week later so nobody no one cares about the sort of order of operation (laughs) that's a brew that i'm actually proud of right my decision making process to arrive at that blue version of table cascade i felt like I, i got it right but then the deck just vanished up in smoke. Yeah, so same thing happened there, right? Like, Field of Dead was not long for this world, and it was, like, such a cool idea. Um, so th- that deck was awesome. If Field of Dead became legal again, I would... I love if we could have... You know what would be a really easy fix for Field of the Dead that I think would make it playable, and I would love it because I missed the card? Only trigger when a, with a, when a land with a different name enters the battlefield. Oh, yeah. Or once a turn... I think once per turn would still be really powerful. <laughs> but I think if you start forcing, like, it has to be a land with a different name than any land in the graveyard or in play. Like, make it so it actually needs to be that and not just, you check the, la- you check the line and then you get three Mr. Forest into play and that's it. Yeah, I actually like that. That's an interesting fix. Maybe hmm. in uh, the future of alchemy, we can uh, see if how playable that is. <laughs> All right. Alaric DeShane writes, what adjacent or adjusted cards would you like to see or you think are safe to put in MH3? So uh, the references, Source of Plowshares got turned into Solitude, him turned into Torok, etc. Mord? Hmm. I would really like, just give me, no, I mean, Baleful Strix will turn into Quarrel. Baleful Strix, huh? I was going to say Baleful Strix because I love Baleful Strix and I just wanted more quaddles. Just give me straight up Baleful Strix. <laughs> okay, so you've chosen violence. <laughs> so Morg has chosen violence. No, no, let me... Uh, taking into account... No, you know what I want? I want weak Gilded Drake. So, quick reminder to people who might not know, because Gilded Drake is a boomer card. Yes. One in a blue for a 3-3 three, three Drake with flying. And when it comes into play, you exchange control of it and another target creature. Yeah, so it has a vast interaction with Charming Prince, which can control of a permanent you own, not that you control. So you just get back your Drake and keep stealing stuff with Charming. Oh, that's awesome. I they know. should just print it as is. Let's do it. Charming I, Prince. I played it in Esper Bile in Legacy. It's my favorite deck. 
<laughs> so the thing, the other, which maybe remind the card I actually want them to add, which I am always praying for, but people will use for unfair stuff, is Spellseeker. <sighs> Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to go, buy a spell seeker, get ephemerate, no. ephemerate by spell seeker, and nerf my three drop. I'm a simple guy. No. Okay. All right, th th that's terrible. <laughs> Mr. Schreiber, take us, take us there. <laughs> <laughs> get more out of here. <laughs> well, the first effect that comes to mind is a faithless looting effect. I was expecting careful study or something like it in MH2, and the fact that they didn't go that route, whatever version of that you think is safe, a one mana draw two, discard two effect. So just clarification, do you think if Careful Study was printed, it would be safe? Yeah, probably. Because you think that Faithless Looting should not be banned? Or do you still believe that? I think that, I mean, it would be totally fine now in Modern. Okay. I think you're insane. It would be powerful, but Modern has gotten so powerful. I think... Okay. I, I think... Just wanted to clarify. I, I think... Now what? Now you make me go into a rubble. <laughs> I think it has the same issue that Death Ray Shaman has. Where people go like, oh, just for my mid range. No, that's why Shaman goes into four color. Looting goes into Murktide. Oh, interesting. You, you think Murktide would play Careful Study? No, I think Murktide would play Looting. <laughs> oh, I see. But that's fine. I mean, like, Faithless Looting would shift the balance of power in the metagame back towards the graveyard decks. No. I think that's fine. Okay, you have some other interesting cards listed here, Dan, so I kind of wanted you to walk through them. Yeah, thinking about that um, adjusted thing... Like Gilded Drake, there's actually a number of really old cards that have unique effects. Now, these are all on the reserve list, so they actually can't be reprinted, but a tweaked version could appear. So Phyrexian Dreadnought came to mind. Um, Phyrexian Tower, that one is actually in Historic, and it's actually pretty interesting there. Oh, yeah. And two other cards that I just like are Squandered Resources, which lets you sacrifice lands for mana, and Tithe, which is just like a weird white instant that gets planes. I love Tithe. Whatever versions of those are safe and don't violate the reserve list, I think would be cool to have to play with. Yeah, Tithe especially, I think, would be very interesting. I think Tithe could just be printed as ease. But is is Tithe on the reserve list? Yeah, unfortunately. Oh. No, and it cannot be power crept. Wait, would Tithe, like straight up Tithe for basic? Yeah, can't you just make it? Yeah, that seems reasonable. And I think that would be a really fun, interesting card. Yeah, I love that. It's not a functional reprint if you just say get a basic planes. It's not only a reprint. They cannot also they cannot like make strictly better versions of cards. Yeah, it's, it'd be strictly worse. Exactly, and that's great. I would love I, I would love that card. I would love a basic tight. Just turn two opponents says the fetch and in response with the fetch in the graveyard tight for two lands. Beautiful. I didn't realize the reserve list went all the way up to visions. I thought they did it when um I guess I, I don't know what the, the machinations of the reserve list. I think it goes as far as Urza's Destiny, I believe. So, oh, okay. Yeah. What about you, David? Any cards that you think could be interesting for MH3? No, I think MH3 <laughs> is a purely uh, a money-making exercise, so they should just print new versions that power creep out, cards that are more than five years old. So I had a really interesting problem when I was reading your answer in that I don't know if my ADHD kicked like, really hard, but I read Monkey-Making Exercise... And for some reason, all I could think of was that you were asking for different ragabans doing different stuff in MH3. That would be great, like a monkey see, monkey do. Exactly. <laughs> all all ragabans. <laughs> oh, that would be great. Like ragaban after he drinks some like gigantoform potion, like three and three red. And it's a monkey, and you have green monkey. ragaban. Yeah. And then yeah. you have blue ragaban, which is like ragaban, but stealthy. <laughs> all right, next question. Kilgore Trout 503 writes, Why do some people like either Modern or Pioneer, but not both? Whenever I try Pioneer, I always wish I was playing Modern instead. I'm struggling to articulate why I feel this way. Some people have the opposite feeling. Daniel, you kind of have a pretty interesting uh, paragraph here, and you've, you've been pretty eloquent, I think, about the differences between the formats uh, in the past. So can you kind of just walk us through it? So this is just a hypothesis, but I feel like in Modern... One of the defining features of the format is that you tend to have the best tool available for any given job. So whatever your deck is trying to do, you're able to accomplish that task with cards that feel like powerful. And you rarely have to put like a bad card into your deck. 
And that feeling of playing modern is like, okay, my deck is the best version of itself, more or less. And I think you'll just feel that. You're drawing and casting powerful cards all the time. Whereas Pioneer, I, I just would not describe Pioneer that way at all. It's just a totally different. You just play with the cards that are available, which I think we really like. But I often see people complaining that they feel like their Pioneer decks are just full of bad cards and they don't feel like they have control over the outcome. I have that exact same. I, I couldn't put it better into words. The reason I play Azorius Urion in Modern and not in Pioneer when likely it's better suited in Pioneer is I dislike the feeling of playing weak cards. Like, I cannot make my full deck play decent cards. I just... And I don't mean, like, weak, like, in a just weak way. I mean, like, an absorb kind of way, right? Like, it's not mm. even in a fun, <laughs> weak way. It's a weak in a weak way. It's not even interesting. Yeah, and for me, I really lost interest in Modern as the Modern Horizon sets pushed out. Any, there's no history at all in the format, so it's literally just the last couple of years of cards. And then it just keeps pushing things that cheat on the rules of magic. In Pioneer, if you make a bunch of plays and your opponent has one mana up or no mana up, you have now played to a point where you can expect exactly the cards they can have to interact with you or not. But in Modern, you can never get to that point. If you don't know their hand, they can cast literally any amount of free spells that can counter your spell, blow up your creature, uh, I don't know, destroy your land, redirect a spell. There's, you never get to a point where you actually know that you've played around a thing. And then, like, the Cascade mechanic means that the baseline for any three-mana instant is that it should make two four-fours, or it functionally, like, is much worse than um, <laughs> any other three-mana instant. So, like, it used to be a format where you could cast, like, Electrolyze and then snap cast or Electrolyze. Now it's, like, three-mana instant make two four-fours. That's, that's the new world that we live in. It's, it's functionally just a bunch of decks that break a lot of rules, which is totally... Fine, people really love to play modern, and I think the gameplay is still pretty reasonable. Uh, I do think that the free spells have really improved the answers, as opposed to the threats. So I think the games are actually more interactive than they have been in the past. But it's really hard to brew, because there's just no substitute for a bunch of these cards. They're just way more powerful than everything else. And the sort of tool thing that we used to do, where we'd find cool old cards from this set or that set uh, in Magic's history, doesn't happen. You just... You could stop your search in like 2019 and you've basically discovered the cards you reasonably can put in your deck. I agree, yeah, I think, but, and that's mostly when it comes to personal preference because I love that part of modern where I'm not exactly sure what might happen. Like, I know the possibilities, and sometimes I'm like, okay, if I had this triple blue card, triple subtlety, I lose the game. <laughs> and I enjoy that. Well, I can see the complete opposite being true. I want you to know if my opponent has one red card, one they have one mana open and it's a red land. It's Bolt or Shock and nothing else. And not the modern possibility of, okay, they might exile Solitude, Defender, they lose two creatures, how do I set up back? So those answers are all describing the features of the respective formats. I think the other big answer is that these formats are so complex that it's really hard to be invested in more than one at a time. They really reward you, like, the, the more invested you are, the more you enjoy a format, the more you understand what's happening. But it's hard to be not just an expert, but even just, like, conversant in two formats at the same time. And when you're just dabbling, you know, playing a tournament in this format now and then, you're just not going to enjoy it as much. You can't achieve that level of immersion and mastery. And that's a big problem for the game as a whole. Like, there is such a thing as too many formats, maybe not for the game, but for a person. Yeah, absolutely. And for a podcast. <laughs> exactly. People struggle to like keep up with two formats at once and enjoy them both. All right. Odin's asked, do you guys still see yourselves playing Magic when you're 60? I don't think Magic is going to make it that far. Oh, that's <laughs> fucking dark. <laughs> Build your battle boxes for exactly. your bunker. <laughs> I mean, this is what it's going to be. Like, I, don't, I love the game. But I also changed games a lot. I used to be a semi-competitive League of Legends player, then Magic appeared. So I'm much more of a computer gamer than my co-hosts are because of my generation, at least, to say the least. So I change a lot, but I love Magic, and I don't think I have ever loved another game as much. I think when I'm 60, I might not ever play Magic with friends anymore, but with my kids, hopefully. I don't have any yet, but I imagine myself doing that. 
And the, the computer versus paper thing actually does make a difference. Like, I feel like none of my current computer games, not that I really play any, will actually be accessible when I'm 60. Oh, 100%. But paper just sticks around. You know, if I build actual paper magic decks and put them in storage and keep them, I will be able to play them for as long as I want. Yeah, I mean, if I made it to 40 playing, I'm sure I'll be playing when I'm 60. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jack Hart writes, what is the most elegantly designed card of the last few years? We just want one. I don't want too many from you guys. So, Dan, you go first. Otherworldly Gaze. <laughs> okay, love it. <laughs> Mord? I'm going to say something extremely controversial. Not as controversial as Yurion, because I'm not a psycho. So I'm going to say Ephemerate. Yeah. What do you think is elegant about that? I, I think it's an interesting card. I think it's a powerful card. Uh, what? I think they found the perfect point at which a bleak effect that can get two for one is strong enough to see play in practically any format when no other blink effect has ever seen play in the history of Magic as a playable card. And it is added in only a mechanic. They didn't that Like, it's literally add a mechanic to a card and make it work. For example, you see, if they tried it with flashback in the Asodius version, they tried it with... I don't know the name of the one that you have creatures to recast it, I don't because that mechanic sucks. I think it's like I don't know the name of that mechanic. So there's a lot of blink effects that just have blink a creature plus stuff, and they never work. Ephemerate is the first time that it actually does what it should do to be C play. Well, we gotta clean up you're you're making a statement that is erroneous, uh, because you are young. Momentary blink was very, very good in its standard format and saw a ton of play. And it fun and this is this is an echo of that, right? This is just a double blink. It's just a cheaper version. But I think momentary blink is a really great design of a card, so I agree with it. Like if you say momentary blink is the other one that sees play, I think it's because it's beautifully designed. Like it does exactly what it should do. It exposes you to get two for one and responds you get a two for one. I just don't consider that an elegant design. I feel like the process of like tweaking and tuning it to try to arrive at something on the appropriate power level is like the opposite of elegant design. I think finding the point. And also I feel like the fact that you waste the rebound so many times is also not elegant. It's like Yeah, I wish it actually was an instant with a flashback for blue to like maybe be a more on the nose callback to momentary blink. Hmm. I don't think that would see play. That's a problem. <laughs> But if I had gone, well, no, I don't no, care sorry. about that. <laughs> I will go for the act. Sorry, because it's the last few years. If I had to go for what was the most elegantly designed card, like in the history of Bashik, like or as that I know of, at least I would say Rancor. Interesting. Do you have an elegant card, David? I would say uh, Ledger Shredder is the most elegantly designed card. Interesting. Wow. Okay. It rewards you in a bunch of different ways. It it actually, like, the thing that struck me, which is, I don't know why I thought it was so funny, all these high-level players, Aspiring Spike, multiple pros, were stunned and worked on their opponent's turn or when their opponent cast spells. Yeah. So it has a very simple text. The text box is actually kind of small. Um, and yet it has actually, like, super deep play without being overpowered, and it sees play in a bunch of different formats. Okay. I like the answer. All right, Kilgore Trout 503 writes, what are the signs that a deck is warping a format when it is not necessarily dominating it? Are we at that point with four-color Omnath and Modern? We might have to, uh... <laughs> Mord might have to recuse himself like he's Justice Thomas. <laughs> I mean, I think when you see, like, main deck answers, right? Like, right now, Legacy is allegedly balanced, but there's main deck Pyroblasts in all these decks, and you could say, like... The blue red list in Pioneer has fundamentally like Graveyard Trespasser is playable main deck because it is a pseudo main deckable card that hates the graveyard. People are main decking hearse. I think Graveyard Trespasser isn't bullet silvery bullet enough to just go to that extent. But the fact that in Legacy the most played card and the fourth most played card are Pyroblast, because it's Pyroblast and Red Elemental Blast. That's I think where you just draw the line. But Omnath is, I mean, I, I don't think Omnath is warping the format because I don't even know, if you told me you have to warp all these existing meta decks and there's a bunch of them in modern, of course, it's a very diverse format. They're all being warped to beat four-color Omnath. What does that even mean? What, what, what are the cards that allegedly beat Omnath? No. Or does it just encourage a type of deck selection, which is like combo-centric to like beat Omnath before it gets to turn, you know, six? I think you. So, this is one of the upsides of the Omnath, like midrange decks. You cannot beat it with cyber bullets unless you're playing, like, I don't know, 
a card that just breaks on Omnath and see a lot of play, for example, in Hammer Sideboard is like, what's the name of the two mana one to fly? Hush Springer. If everybody was playing that, I would say it's a bit skewed, but the other alternative is like the meta was like four color Omnath and Belcher slash Living End, right? Like, the only fair deck is Omnath fighting against the unfair decks, which crash on Omnath. I don't think Omnath is anywhere close to warping the format. I don't certainly don't think it's dominating it, and I don't think it should be banned. Even I mean, just the fact that people get annoyed playing against it is ridiculous. I agree. We all get annoyed playing against a deck. I hate playing against Spirits and Pioneer. Dan used to get enraged every time you lose to Storm in Modern way back in the day. I mean, we just <laughs> we all have decks we hate to lose to. I don't think I think it warps the format in the fact that you just can't play regular Shand and expect to win when you're just the inferior mid range deck. I don't think it warps it more than it just draws a line in how strong your fair deck has to be. Which is annoying because people love playing weak fair decks, like Shan. But I don't think it it's dominating the format at all. Alright. Chat Nuga writes, In the past few sets there have been a number of overlooked cards, not specifically by you guys, but broadly, that turn out to be staples. Graveyard Trespasser, Fable, Shredder, Hearse, etc. During spoiler season, what traits do you look for that indicate playability, and what about these cards make them go under the radar for so long? Gosh, that's a huge question. Yeah. A really important question. It's nice that Chattanooga has like provided this little group, and we can, we can look within this group of four and see what, what we can learn from them. Looking at Trespasser, Graveyard Trespasser, and Fable of the Mirror Breaker, the first thing you notice about them is that they're like two cards in one. The text does not fit on the front side of the card. You flip it over and continue reading on the back side, and you get all that stuff, right? Like, there's no catch. You just get all of it. So you're just getting more card than you used to think was possible at a pretty decent point on the mana curve. Now, that's not enough by itself, right? There, every saga fits that description, so it has to also, like, have some function in the metagame. It has to have some two-for-one potential or three-for-one potential, which... You know, I think a lot of people don't quite realize that when you when you first read Graveyard Trespasser, it's not obvious that it's a two-for-one. It's not obvious that it's bigger than other creatures in the formats. Unless you're thinking of Pioneer specifically, you might not realize that it actually has a purpose in the metagame of, like, fighting against Arclight Phoenixes and the like. Yes, well, I think, um, coupling into what Dan said at the end, how deeply their knowledge of a specific metagame slash format is it's going to change this a lot for example i was able to immediately agree with david when we were saying that hers is going to be amazing because he saw it amazing in pioneer and i saw it as amazing in modern but as someone who has almost literally zero knowledge in pioneer when he said trespasser was going to create card i was like i trust in your judgment and i really think you're wrong but you know more than i do on the topic so i i think i agree yeah, I mean, I think the key point here is context, right? When we looked at Fable, I that was a miss for me. I, I would argue, though, that Dan had it exactly right. He said, this card gives you a ton. Are you going to have enough time to do it all? In Modern, this card has never played fair. When it sees play, it does something to generate. It supports, you know... Um, Glimpse of Tomorrow. Yeah, or, or the Red Red X. Um, yeah, in a bit like, yeah, because it's not a creature... So it doesn't get hit by creativity, yeah. or it's more than three, so it doesn't get hit by the cascades. But it doesn't see play in like Jund, right? It it doesn't see play like Jund is not a very good deck in modern, and this in that deck is not in general thought to be the optimal build of a mediocre deck. Yeah, this is not the best. Like it's really hard. If I can play any three drop, you're gonna have to convince me real hard to play season by, to play this over season by the monster. The thing is, when you say, no, no, Season Paramancer is off-limits due to being a creature or double red cost or whatever, I go like, okay, now I'm more interested in the Fable. Trespasser, yeah, again, it, the only reason this card sees play is it's a main deck graveyard hate card that is reasonable in mid-range matchups. Shredder is the more interesting card to me. Like I was having to mention in the previous question or two questions ago, I don't even think people knew what it did. The number of people that were stunned the first time they, you know, looted on their opponent's turn when they cast, you know, two removal spells uh, told me that maybe it literally is people aren't reading the card completely. <laughs> I think that's part of it. I think the other thing is that even though it's a, it's a simple card, it actually is asking you to track something new. Like no other card asks you to track when is the second spell cast in a turn by any player. And because we've never had to play with that effect before, we just didn't compute right away how often that happens. 
Well, there, there, there were a series of cards that did that, though, right? Isn't there a two mana two two that makes a one one on your second spell? The isn't there a two and a red o oh, four? Does that do like it bolts when you cast your second spell, or is that only when you draw your second card? I might be wrong. I Those are when you draw your second card, but that's only oh, okay, when you okay. do it, right? Like, okay, but how often does a player, does any player, cast two spells in a turn? Right. Fair point. Fair point. We've never had to think about that before, so I think people just didn't realize this just triggers all the time. And then to the Shredder point is one that Dan makes almost every time we look at cards, the lower spots on the curve just always overperform, right? One drops, two drops. They just ask so little of you as an investment. Hearse is a two-mana card. Shredder is a two-mana card. Fable and Trespasser uh, see a lot of play in Pioneer. Three-mana is really kind of like two-mana in Modern. Uh, they just happen early enough that you actually do have time. I mean, that was the kind of the insight that Dan had is you actually have plenty of time to cast your fable. Um, and it's one of the reasons why Winona got banned, honestly. Also, when you're looking at creatures, it's really hard to see. So with it as a sorceries, you know exactly what you're getting out of them, right? I'm getting this. I'm exactly getting this. With creatures, you're getting anything from a one-time loot to 20 points of damage. So you start to have to... I mean with permanents more rather than creatures. You need to actually analyze how big the payoff can be. For example, a lot of people, not even me, I didn't consider Shredder to be that good, but it's pretty consistent for him to become a 4-5 beatdown stick all of a sudden. So that's one of the higher upside games when compared to the lower downside games where it's a 2-mana 1-3 that never does anything. The big thing I look for, though, in a spoiler is if it's like a mythic rare that's blue-green and Damon doesn't think it's playable, it's going to get banned. Um, <laughs> Wait, I'm missing, I'm missing a meme. And all I can think of, did he say that Uro and Oko are going to be bad? He, he was arguing with Damon we shouldn't even do an Uro, like Oko weak, because Oko is so weak. And then when Uro is spoiled, Dan was just like, dude, this card is really good. And Damon's like, why would you ever cast this card? I don't even want to cast it from the graveyard. No, no. And we were like, dude, no. you, mi you missed on Oko. Like, at least, you know, have a little... So I did softly, Just a little chill on her. I got a soft miss on Oko because I said it was going to be good. Like I said, I won't choose for my Nip deck. And eventually I was playing four and four Gilded Goose, but that's... <laughs> time passed gone. But at least I got Udo right. Yeah, Dan tried to help him each time. Dan, you know, Dan's an optimist, and and with the fire design, his optimism was like exactly in line with how insane, or maybe not even optimistic enough for how powerful some of these cards were. One thing that Oko has in common with the four cards Chattanooga mentioned is that the, all these cards do all this stuff without asking you to invest any other mana or anything else. Yes. So yeah, it's 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 when you have continuous effects that don't require mana. Yes. Cards that are cheap and cards that are specifically best in class. Those are all cards that I think Dan, when he's highlighted some of these cards he's interested in, those are consistent uh, things, and they tend to be much more powerful than, than we think. Yes. And modular cards, right? They sometimes do sometimes it does this, sometimes it does that. Those all tend to outperform what we think is going to happen. And there's, as we get more text on these cards, there's just a lot more variables, a lot more decisions. The decision tree gets very complicated. I mean, I think it's also it's easier to underestimate a deck a card with a lot of text. It's not that cards with more text tend to be better; it's that it's easier to underestimate them. Mm. Yeah, because a one mana five five we all know is amazing. The more paragraphs you add to that card, the more margin of error there is. All right, we are going to machine gun through a few more here as we get near the end. So D Jeff W X writes. Pioneer cut off at Return to Ravnica. What cards from Innistrad block would you have liked to see in Pioneer for Brewing? What cards would have been bad for Pioneer? Dan, you have a pretty great list here, so I'll just let you maybe highlight some cards you think would be interesting. Yeah, I love this question. I actually went through the entire Innistrad block on Scryfall. <laughs> I feel like if, 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 they, if they want to consult, Dan just has the freaking database. He's ready to roll. He's, he's, he's really thought through this. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, this is awesome. He went so deep. I mean, the first thing you notice is that most of the cards are completely irrelevant for Pioneer. Yes. So let me just highlight the four that I think would actually be bad for Pioneer and should not be brought in. Those four are Gristlebrand, uh, because we just don't want a creature like that. <laughs> that, um, that is like always the best creature to cheat into play that ends the game. Terminus, because that gets into that free spell territory. It's a swinginess that is actually like not helpful. Faithless Looting pains me to say it, but I think that would just upset the balance of power too much. I think you would immediately have to ban the Delve Spells if you brought Looting in. 
And the last card here, this is just for Mord, is Abundant Growth, which actually came from Abyssin Restored. I didn't realize that. Should not be brought into Pioneer, because I don't want Yorian decks to be any better. Coward. So if you're going to ban Yorian, then yes, by all means, bring Abundant Growth in. But like, we don't want any more Yorian formats. Mercifully, Pioneer doesn't have that many Yorian decks in it. <laughs> and I want to stay that way, so Abundant Growth would, I think, be bad for Pioneer. I'm just going to say something pretty ballsy, which is I think there are not enough but Yorion decks because people haven't realized yet. I think it's a matter of time. I think it's an inevitability. <laughs> Possibly. So those four are ones that I would like actively exclude okay. from Innistrad block. Um, there's a few more that I'm actually not sure like how they would affect Pioneer. Those are Snapcaster Mage, Cavern of Souls, Champion of the Parish, Crater Hoof Behemoth, for similar reasons to Gristlebrand. I'm not sure if that would just become mm. like instantly in the game. And then Thought Scour, uh, again, because of the Delve cards. So I'm not sure how, how you guys feel about those. I think Cavern of Souls is something you need to do when you make Counterspells too good. But as Mord was complaining about, but I love, Absorb is the best Counterspell in the format, uh, if it's not Sensor. Yeah. Um, and so then we don't need Cavern of Souls. Cavern of Souls, I think, is like a necessary evil in Modern because there's all these crazy counterspells that they've made legal. I think you just kill co control if you allow like tribal decks to be con completely uncontrollable. Or mono green. Yeah, Champion of Parish is awesome. I, I actually like making human decks better. I don't think you can make Thought Scour legal. I would love Snapcaster. So I, I'd say yes, Snapcaster. Yes, Champion of Parish. I think they actually kind of work well against each other. Right, Snapcaster makes the control decks a little better. Champion hmm. of Parish makes your disruptive okay. humans aggro better. Yeah, I think you need both. And I don't think we have the right creature to tutor for with all these random decks. I think Crater Hoof is not that good okay. uh, as a target. I, I I don't think it would actually change the format at all. It's it's almost like a random dredge card. It's either going to be totally busted or see zero play. <laughs> um, so maybe there's no extra benefit to printing it. But Yeah, so those nine cards are like the ones that I would be like, mm, I'm not sure. But everything else, like literally everything else from Innistrad block would be good for Pioneer. Do you think Lily? I think... Lily's the one where you got me at. Really? Well, a bunch of these cards, like, we think of them as modern staples, but they've been mostly pushed out of modern. And I think Pioneer is getting to the power level where these will be fine, powerful, interesting, yeah. but not broken additions to Pioneer. So Liliana of the Veil, vale, I mean, Huntmaster of the Fells, <laughs> Geist of St. Trap. Lingering Souls would be a great addition. I would love, yeah. Uh, the, the cards you have as good are just so sweet. Like, I don't know. I didn't realize so many of my favorite cards are there. Restoration Angel. Yeah. Geist of St. Traft, seeing play again would be super cool. Yes. Especially without Exalted, I actually think Geist is like just a super interesting fair card. I actually think on Burial Rides might be too good, but mm. it would be interesting to have like a really good reanimator effect, but I don't know if it needs to be rights. But yeah, I, I love these cards you highlighted, Dan. There's just a bunch of super cool ones in there. Falcon Wrath Aristocrat. I love that card. <laughs> yeah. And th again, there's no free sack effects. Putting on a 4-1 creature that can be killed uh, just seems very reasonable. Yeah, I all right, this may maybe needs to be the new format. <laughs> Pioneer Plus. <laughs> Pioneer Plus. Postmodern. All right, real quick here. Fairy Vandal writes, with a preview of Textless Omnath, we highlighted that last week. Very beautiful, Textless Omnath. Much like Cryptic Command has a shit ton of extra text. Uh, are there any particular cards you would like to see get promo treatments? Neem. Oh. Oh, yeah, I didn't think of that. I was going to say uh, Ice Cauldron. <laughs> Neem, no, Neem fits really well. Ice Cauldron. It's a big, flashy dragon, enough to make it yes. like... Neem would fit great as a promo card. Yeah, that is 100% the answer. That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> All right. Stevie B writes, Etherflux Reservoir and Bolas Citadel are both legal in Pioneer. Why don't they see any play together? So, of course, just as a quick reminder... Netherflex Reservoir says every time you cast a spell, you gain a life equal to the number of spells you cast this turn. And Bolas the Citadel says you may play the top card of your uh, library for no mana. You just have to pay life. So in theory, those two cards in play let you, you know, play your deck until you hit your second land for the turn. So I believe that this would be a violation of the too many knuckleheads rule, which yeah. David, you famously coined. What is that? So Pat Riley, who is the uh, famous architect of the L.A. Lakers dynasty in the 80s, the Knicks in the 90s, and the Miami Heat uh, okay. for the last 20 years, had said that one of the things that he did is, you know, you have a lot of talented players in the NBA, but he only wanted like one knucklehead on his team. 
because if you only had one knucklehead, he would be positively influenced by the Magic Johnsons and the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar bars and the LeBron Jameses. <laughs> but if you have two knuckleheads together, then they like bring out the worst in each other. Like they go at each other on to start fights. They go out to the club when they shouldn't. They are, you know, <laughs> drinking at halftime. Okay, they exponentialize each other instead of getting the positive aspect from the other. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So they reinforce the negative parts, but if you just bring in, like, just bring in Dennis Rodman to the Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen, who keep themselves in great shape and are very disciplined, <laughs> brought out the best in Dennis Rodman. Okay. Even though he was, yeah, like banging, you know, Carmen Electra and missed multiple NBA games to gamble in Las Vegas, but <laughs> they still won three titles in a row. That was the good part about him. <laughs> yeah. So the brewing equivalent is you see a sweet card like Bolus of Citadel and you're like, man, it's almost there. Like maybe, maybe I can just make it better by adding this other sweet card and imagining having them both of them play at the same time. Okay. As Stevie B is proposing here. But in truth, like each of those cards is a knucklehead. They're barely playable. Etherflux Reservoir is, is not playable. It is sweet to get them both and play at the same time, but you're not going to make your deck better by trying to make these two bad cards hang out in the same locker room. Now, there is an interesting question. Like, could you make this your Indomitable Creativity X equals 2 endgame? And you could, but it's not even a guaranteed kill because Citadel would get stuck on lands. I don't see the future for these two particular cards together. Yeah, me neither. All right, this is a big one for Mord. Ipochali, or Ipocali, writes, Why is Dirtling so good in four-color gameplay, but so bad in things like Soul Herder shells or other toolboxy things, like Mord Usuron? This is a 5-0 Urion Soul Herder main deck Luris and four Imperial Recruiters. Is it too toolbox? Okay, so if, because of this question, there's a reason David is asking the questions, because he's the one that's willing to always shut me down before I go too long. <laughs> Because this question is dangerous for me. So, okay. He did some stretching. He's ready to burn some calories here. I'm going to start this TED Talk by saying the reason why Dirtling is so, co so good in four-color gameplay is because during deck building, you make a decision where you're balancing, balancing the consistency of your game plan against the power of your deck. You have decks like Taxes and you have decks like Burn, which are extremely consistent, extremely non dirty and for that reason, the individual power of the cards is weak. And in that, you have a lot of... N you barely have non-games, okay? When you're playing Burn, when you're playing Taxes, you lose the games because you did your plan and your plan was not good enough. When you're playing the complete opposite of that spectrum, which was Neighbor, is for color, you lose the games where you didn't get to perform your game plan due to A, the instability of your own deck of what your opponent is playing that you are completely unprepared against. So, let's grab four color midrange, for example. You don't lose the games where you go removal, 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 Omnath. Doesn't happen unless you get comboed out, and because that's completely out of left field. What happens with burn? You bolt, you bolt, you bolt, you bolt. Either the fifth bolt was enough, or the fifth bolt wasn't enough. And that's a coin flip. Something happened in the middle. So, you're just dawdling your own way because the choice you made for the like, power in your deck has to be powerful enough. There is an exception to this and that works in a really strange way, which is the toolbox aspect. So my turn to sanctify them back can either be the most powerful card in the game or the most deadly one. And that's gonna be defined only by matchup. So if I go turn to sanctify it against Rakdos, it's the best card in the game. I won the game. This is insane. Now, the, the question comes, in what matchups is a 4-mana Sanctifier worth it? And that's when the tutor, you have to add the price of the tutor to the Spicy Fire effect. People realize eventually, okay, I could play a 4-mana Sanctifier when it's great, but how much worse is it than an Omnath? <laughs> like, let's just say I could always have the 4-mana Sanctifier. In how many games would I just rather cast Omnath? So when we're talking about dirtling in this context, like which cards are actually dirtling cards or dirtly cards? Eladam Briscoll, Imperial Recruiter, um, cards that are getting you to your game plan. So Abundant Growth, Abundant growth exactly, be... is a dirtly card. What about Expressive Iteration? Expressive Iteration, I don't think it's as dirtly because you're actually getting to look at extra resources. You're actually making card advantage in the way. Once you play Abundant Growth, the only thing you can say you have done is besides slight cantripping, is fixing your mana. So if that's the case, then in the four-color Omnath deck, the only dirtly card is Abundant Growth. Yes, 
But it turtles to its own, like how many games I haven't been able to cast an up a Brennan 6 because I have an island, a forest, and a abundant growth. I mean, I'm wondering if the answer is that, okay, it started off with a dirtily deck like Soul Herder and people were trying to play Eldamri's Calls and things like that, but eventually people figured out that you can cut all the dirtle and just play efficient cards that yeah. give you as much without having to dirtle. And actually, four color does not dirtle at all, except for abundant growth. I, th I think that's pretty much closer, yeah. I think you just dirtle when the deck f loses its capability to function because you just went too greedy. Like, it's bound to happen. We're playing four colors and they're only fixing its abundant growth. Like, we lost the original Utopia Sprawls that helped. We lost a lot of the things that helped us along the way. Or Astrolabe. So sometimes you just look at your hands that are like, Forest, Abundant Growth, Island. I can either have a turn one Abundant Growth and Hope, and then you have a Brennan 6. Or do I wait to play my Abundant Growth on my Island to play my Brennan 6? Is Brennan 6 a dirty card? No. I think if you're making card advantage, you're not darling. <laughs> okay. I think I think Renin Six is the ultimate uh, dirty card. It doesn't do anything other than just make sure you get to play all your spells for the rest of the game. I mean, I just I had this. So this reminds me of like when I started playing Magic, I saw Dark Confident, and whenever my opponent hit a hit of Dark Confident, whenever they hit a land, I was like, wow, so lucky. But I didn't feel the same way whenever I played a land of the top with my Corsair of Crufix. And they are the exact <laughs> same amount of card advantage, okay? And they don't feel like the same. When your opponent draws a land with, with a confident, whoa, what a card. When you get a land off the top with Crufix, eh, what a trigger. Brennan 6 is hitting a land off the top with your Crufix every single turn. Is your dark confident giving you a land off the top every single turn? And without the risk of losing life. Like, every single turn is giving you that land off the top, which you greet so much with your confidence. So this is a, this is a sweet zag. Corsair of Crufix is the pioneer Ren and Six. I love it, yeah. <laughs> I love Corsair of Crufix. I would, I, I, like, if you ask me what was the best time I had playing Magic was when I was playing the green-white value town that had a 4-tracker, 4 Crufix, 4 Knight of the Relic Quarry. There's no better feeling in Mashing than activating Nike, looking for a fetch, put an effect into play, look at the top of your deck, see if you like it, if you don't fetch... And just start making clues with your tracker, draw a car, play a land, play a Susa, and go off. Most enjoyable magic. So, so the summary, if we can, you know, make a short story long here, is the cards, the individual cards in four color are powerful so enough individually powerful that they that they feel powerful enough to a silver bullet. Like Omnath is so powerful that if I could decide between in the specific matchup where I want El Alambre's Call for Sanctifier, it's not that much better than just slamming an Omnath. Solitude is such strong as a removal that having the capability of getting a Skyclay became irrelevant. The cards are so good that looking for the best bullet, there's not enough incentive now. Because I could just be doing something great in every single matchup instead of something extremely powerful in some while extremely weak in others. Yeah, so sort of what we talked about a little bit with modal spells, right? You just want generically super powerful cards, and you found a way to stuff them all into the same deck. I, you, you want your cards to be doing one stuff and doing it perfectly nowadays, because you cannot make your reach big enough. That's, for example, why one of the few um, double spell cards is Fire and Ice. Fire and Ice is always good, because it can trips as worst-case scenario. All right, so hopefully we've explained it. Also... We'd like to reject the premise of the question a little bit. Aspiring Spike has been having a lot of success with a Soul yeah. Herder shell uh, that does not play Urian, does not play Omnath in Modern. I'm going to say, though, a lot of those wins are from opponent inexperience, and I don't think that deck will thrive. I just think it's a master builder, a master player, and getting the reps in. Like, I think the deck is good. I think it's worse than 4C. And I have made a comparison before. I think Soul Herder is recent Reef, but... Bad. Mm. <laughs> All right. So there you have it. Don't don't make toolbox decks. Just play generically powerful cards. I mean, and if you're playing toolbox decks, you need to have a plan B that's just efficient. And that was the problem eventually. If you look at those toolbox decks, most of my wins came from like turn two brought back into short and then a showdown of the skulls. Because I love showdown of the skulls. <laughs> I do too. Let's just see more play in Pioneer. I gotta get on that. Yeah, we should get on that. If you're ever building showdown, let me know. I want you... Oh, oh, there's an amazing build I have to send you with that. Remind me of sending you that build. Okay. So, question for you, David. What are your top three movie recommendations? 
All right, so this is from Camberleaf. Here's what I'm going to do. Well, this will be a little Discord uh, thing. I made a top 10 list at the end of every year that I would like share with my friends and mm-hmm. we would discuss like our favorite movies of the year. So I've got like 25 years worth of that. Whoa. I stopped doing it in the last few years because the movie industry in America has basically collapsed with the advent of streaming, hmm. which is crushed. Like there, there are very few actual great movies made a year. I will see if I can actually find those lists somewhere. Yes. And if I cannot, I will make a bunch of movie recommendations, but they will not be mainstream movies, right? Everybody knows like Godfather is a great movie, Perfect. Like Chinatown, etc. But I will find some from the, like in the 90s and the, the 2000s movies maybe people haven't heard of, and I will recommend those. And I will post them on the Discord. So that's a free bonus to the people on the Discord. 25 years of top 10 lists from David? If I can find that, I, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. And well, finally... A question from Orbilar, the one that has forsaken us. <laughs> Mana symbol. Mana symbol writes, Is it possible for Faithless Ruin to have a host so faithless that you won't be able to rule them? And I'm going to say is, I miss you, idiot. <laughs> it's a stupid question, beautifully asked. And uh, yes, we do miss uh, Mana symbol. We hope he's having fun <laughs> playing in his band. On the high seas. He's having a great time, and that makes me yes. really happy. Every single notice I see from him, he's just enjoying the best life that he could have, and I'm really happy for him. Just miss the idiot. So I hope everybody enjoyed this, uh, us answering the hard-hitting questions that have been plaguing the uh, Magic community. We got through it in a tight <laughs> 80 minutes here. <laughs> it could have been worse. It could have been much worse. We were electroshocking uh, more to get into... <laughs> Not go too deep into the uh, Omnath uh, <laughs> construction. There was a lot of questions where David sees me just like wrapping up. as like, okay, next question. <laughs> it was like the Shaggy the Box getting ready. But these were great questions. Yes, absolutely. We, I, I love the questions this week. They're excellent job. Before we started, we were just saying exactly that, everybody. These questions were top-notch this time. Yeah. All right, so next week we will be back with a, uh, a look back at our Grixis lists and Mario lists. I've actually... Just missed five O's with a bunch of different Grixis builds. Dan was a less <laughs> tried some of my worst decks, so he had uh, less results. We'll get into that next week. Uh, we'll see if any more cards are spoiled. And until then, gentlemen, I bid you adieu. Bye bye, everybody. That's a wrap on this edition of the Faithless Brewing Podcast. Visit faithlessbrewing.com for deck lists, articles, and more. Support for this podcast is provided by brewers like you. Join the Faithless family at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing for Discord access, bonus content, and more. Help keep the show going and come brew with us. That's all for today. Stay safe and we'll see you next time.